And so we're going to wrap up the history of cognitive science now just by noting that an awful lot has happened since the 1960s. Um, the, com the cognitive turn in the middle of the 20th century profoundly altered the landscape, but it opened up a wide variety of new approaches to thinking about minds, brains, and behavior. And in the meantime, several old themes have come back to find new life as well. One of the most significant developments was the gradual feeling among researchers in artificial intelligence and computational theories of mind that the whole approach, which was founded on the rule-based manipulation of symbols in a manner analogous to what goes on inside a computer, might be at the wrong level of granularity. The kind of models, the understanding of human cognition wasn't meaningful terms of concepts like dog, table, and such like. Uh, those symbols, it was argued, might perhaps be too granular, uh, too, too coarse-grained to adequately account for the sophistication, nuance, context sensitivity of human cognition. And so the uh, one elaboration of the computational theory suggested that one should try to um, describe the relevant interface between the person and the world at a lower level, at a, at a finer, more atomistic level of sub-symbolic processing. Gödel Escherbach, a famous book by Doug Hofstadter that won the Pulitzer Prize, came out in 1979, I think. And that is a very entertaining read. I recommend it. It was the book that got me into cognitive science once upon a time. And uh, in that book, some of the more profound elaborations of this approach are presented, although it's very much of its time. But out of this suspicion that we were working at the wrong level, grew a new field of artificial neural networks, or connectionism as it's called. This arose, or found its second legs, shall we say, in the mid-1980s. It is a framework uh, hugely influenced by that 1943 paper of Warren McCullough's that we saw, which identified individual neurons or nerve cells in the brain as little processing units, logical processing units. And this gave rise to a form of modeling in which networks of small processing units, basically derived from Warren McCullough, were linked together uh, and mathematical techniques were derived in order to um, find the appropriate way of linking these together such that they could compute, that is, transform inputs into desired outputs, allowing them to learn automatically, sort of, from specific data sets. The principal breakthrough here came in 1986 with the introduction of an algorithm known as backpropagation. This is the algorithm which allowed the very many numbers in such a model to be set automatically by exposure to data. This gave rise to um, unbridled fantasies and imagination of what one could do with these things. It also gave rise to a huge domain of research which has acquired its own independence since then. Uh, if we contrast the approaches of connectionism or artificial neural networks with the original rather coarse-grained symbolic computational approaches, well, we, we can draw the contrasts like this in early artificial intelligence models. The symbols that were being manipulated in such models were word-like, like concepts, like tea and table. In connectionist networks, they're at a finer level of granularity. They are numbers. First of all, they're numerical. Um, and the manner in which one maps reality onto numbers is infinitely open. In the original approaches of early cognitive psychology and in the generative linguistics, language played a very central role, and syntax, um, which refers to that rule-based domain that governs the ordering of words within a particular language, um, that fitted right in, but in connectionist approaches, we tend to use um, not individual elements which are comparable to words, but much more fine-grained distributed representations so that a whole bunch of numbers together might play the role of one symbol in a computational approach. 
But the philosophy is never far away, and the questions we've been reviewing over the last 2,000 years here uh, ensure that each of these developments led to its own recasting, rethinking of what human cognition was on the, on the side of computationalism heavily influenced by linguistic theory. Human cognition was viewed as being inherently language-like, and we get the idea that there might be a language of thought. Connectionism, in some respects, picks up on older approaches, empirical approaches, in which associations are learned between, for example, inputs and outputs. So some of the themes of behaviorism are coming back here. Um, the apparently endless swinging of the pendulum between rationalist and empiricist concerns that we've met already is evident here, where the early AI models, indeed the very notion of artificial intelligence, is a strongly rationalist notion emphasizing an abstract, worldless conception of um, cognition. Uh, connectionists, through their connection with data, provided something of an empirical pushback against this. The learning mechanisms employed in training neural networks are very, very generic. So backpropagation can be used to train networks for all kinds of tasks, whereas computationalism gave rise to a much more um, de a modular architecture in which it was assumed, much in line with the phrenologists of the 18th century, it was assumed that the mind is largely modular, uh, with different parts doing different things in different ways. Um, connectionism, of course, ultimately became the field of machine learning, which had now plays such an, a, a very important role in our lives. And the deep learning that you read about in popular magazines these days is a development of the connectionism, but one which has largely left its roots in consideration of questions relevant to human cognition. So those are some of the developments that have happened. Um, all along, there has been in these 20th century approaches a, um, a lack of attention to the body. And this is coming back now in a big way. At least in the 1990s, a lot of researchers in cognitive science have tried to understand the relationship between brains, bodies, worlds in very, very different ways. Um, and we might refer to this as the embodied turn, noting again that it doesn't represent a single approach, but a family of approaches. But ones in which, for example, the relationship between minds and brains is subject to a great deal of critique. The brain is, after all, an organ of the body, just like kidneys. Um, we have a tendency perhaps to project rather too much onto an innocent biological organ made of meat, I might say. Some of the reasons for this come also from philosophy, and they come from a resurgence of interest in some of those original motivating concerns of scientific psychology, which is to understand human experience. In philosophy, this has been developed in the school known as phenomenology, and such concerns have had a hard time forging meaningful links with ongoing scientific work, but more and more there's a, um, a two-way traffic between the philosophy of experience and scientific work in embodied cognitive science. Cognition here is not seen as the rule-based manipulation of representations, but as a form of activity grounded in the organism. So organism is an odd word to use, given everything that we've said so far, but the roots of this really come from biology. It's an attempt to understand not human nature or some magic properties of godlike cognition that humans might have, but to understand humans as biological beings, and so to come up with biologically grounded accounts of cognition. In some respects, this is a continuation of the project of Charles Darwin, who um, reminded us with force that we are in the natural world and not apart from it. One uh, popular term that's used these days for embodied approaches is the 4E label to describe mind as embodied, as extended, so not restricted to brains. Mind cognition is something that happens in the interplay of an organism with its immediate environment. 
embedded, so indistinguishable from context, something we saw in Skinner as well, and inactive, that is to say that the what we think of as mind is brought into being through the activities of an organism in interaction with its world. Um, we won't have time for a full treatment of this, but these concerns are going to recur again and again throughout this module. And it's, note, it's worth taking note of the fact that at, at the heart of this debate is some very serious concerns around what role we should apportion to the human body, what we think the body is, and of course the brain as part of that body. Notice that very many of our most intractable disputes revolve precisely around the body. Think of the divisive issues of euthanasia, abortion, women's health, um, human rights, all ultimately revolve around what is the relationship between the person and the body. They are not clearly the same thing. So here we have something which stands apart from the computational theory of mind, including both connectionist and symbolic variants. And if we might draw the comparison this way, in computational theories of mind, the mind is in a rather Cartesian sense, seen as interior, personal, divorced from the world. And the person in acting on the world is more like someone who pushes a button and waits for something to happen. That is, there's a a direction from the person to the world. Here we find typically clear but unanalyzed distinctions between subjects and objects, which is um, precisely the problem that Descartes introduced with his cogito. And the view of the brain taken, um, bearing in mind that it bears the um, the bulk of explanatory load here as the computational organ um, is rather unbiological and images such as that on the bottom left, galaxy brain kind of images, where the brain is represented as blue and shining light. Such images are rather reminiscent of medieval religious paintings in which the Holy Spirit or the Godhead is seen emanating from lines out to the cosmos. So there are philosophical issues we might have about this. And in 4E approaches, we might contrast those three characteristics of a computational approach in the following way. Instead of seeing action as being me to the world, that is, I act on an inert world, in an 4E approaches, rather that relationship is seen as complementary, is a form of a dance that arises between body and world. And indeed, when I say body and world, what we find here is a loosening of distinctions, a little bit of uncertainty introduces what we mean by world or environment, or there are many other terms that can arise here. It's not quite clear what the correct way of characterizing the context that is so important to any emerging behavior is. And likewise, whereas computational approaches usually assume that we're simply talking about the person who is the soul, who is the mind, who is the brain, over here in 4E approaches, we might be a little bit more reserved and try to develop an awareness of when we're talking about something which is attributable to the body or when what we observe should be attributed, for example, to distributed social processes. So the nature of the system under discussion um, varies from discussion to discussion. We've problematized, in other words, both mind and world. And instead of the brain acting as a controlling device ordering the otherwise inert body like a puppet master, what we see is an emphasis on coordination. So the whole uh, vocabulary of control, so important on the left, becomes one of coordination on the right. And with this, I've just given you a tiny glimpse of some of the interdisciplinary, highly varied landscape that exists in contemporary cognitive science. We met this diagram before. Um, we'll be stopping at some of these way stations and identifying some others. But I want to finish up now by coming back to the beginning of this section of the course, noting that there are some oppositions that we shouldn't seek to obliterate or to treat as team sports where one must come down, to come down on one side or another. By opening ourselves to questioning the nature of human experience and behaviour, 
by asking ourselves reflective questions about ourselves, there is always going to be a tension between particular terms. So presentism and eternalism will constantly be with us, for presentism refers to that which is ongoing in the here and now, whereas eternalism refers to a transcendent view of time as simply existing from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch. We associated these with Heraclitus and Parmenides, respectively. Many of the questions of mind can be, many of the elaborate constructions and fictions we build about minds can be seen as ways of dealing with these, for in a presentist frame, the earth is flat. I look down and I see the, the earth ground. Whereas if I think in a transcendental sense, I know the earth is spherical. How do we get from one to the other? Well, one way to do it is to construct the notion of mind, but there might be other ways. We've seen um, disputes or different approaches about how I know the world. Is the wor Are things in the world represented through me, through the mediation of, for example, nerve cells? Or am I directly in the presence of, am I directly witnessing things in the world? This contrast, and coming back again to Heraclitus and Parmenides, is one between a notion of emergence and becoming, or a more static notion of being. We've seen the eternal flip-flop in Western philosophy between empiricist and rationalist concerns, with the empiricists focusing heavily on the role of the senses, bodily experience, interaction in the world, and so on. Whereas the rationalist um, concerns tend to be more occupied with abstracta, such as intellect and reasoning and logic. And the dualist problem introduced by Descartes, which pits mind against world, finds a, an entirely different form of elaboration when we see mind as a fundamental property of all living beings, that is, mind in life, which is one position which is being developed within embodied cognitive science. So this gives you some sense of the landscape that we're going to be um, charting our course through throughout this module. And you can see now, I hope, why there's not going to be a single theory or framework proposed. Rather, we're going to address many problems from many different directions. In some cases, most of the work is done, elaborated in one theoretical framework or another. And we will look at those and we will note also their potential shortcomings and alternative approaches. So that concludes the first topic of this module. We've covered an awful lot of history in a very, very superficial sense. Um, and we move on to the next topic, which is human language, which became central to our accounts of cognition around about the middle of the 20th century.